Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we are, oh, that's your team. <laughs> We're, Thank you so much for having us. We're so grateful to be here. Um, above all, I think we're really grateful to be doing this together. Um, uh, we really want to thank Kat for thinking of bringing us together. Uh, in this process, we really realized um, why she had done so. Um, although we come from very different backgrounds uh, and we do uh, different things, um, perhaps there's something in the way that we were brought up and our multicultural experience uh, that allows us to uh, lead creative teams in a certain way that we realize is much more similar than dissimilar. And um, uh, thank you for being gracious enough to hear our story and uh, hopefully um, we could share some things that we use that all of you can use uh, to perhaps apply to your teams and um, realize the benefits of um, multicultural experiences as, as it relates to creativity. So um, please welcome Naz Arandi, or as I like to call her, sorry, <laughs> as I like to call her, creative mother of unicorns, uh, Netflix, um, of course, and uh, currently Airbnb. Um, I think that the work that Naz leads and creates is the kind of work that I think we all love to create because it's at once ahead of its time, but also very current, and yet it feels so natural that it, all, that it really belongs. Um, and so maybe, Anaz, you could tell us how you got to create that kind of work in um, the beginning. Thank you, Alana. And I, I don't know if you guys can tell, but we met two and a half weeks ago <laughs> for the first time. Um, but it was absolutely love and admiration at, the, at first glance. And Kat, if this doesn't work out, you're a matchmaker. Yes. hundred like percent. Like, you don't even know. Um, um, so I'm, again, like, so grateful and and excited to be here and so humble to be invited um, to share this talk with Alana in front of all you guys who are here to make a big difference. Um, I grew up in Iran um, in the second largest city in Iran called Mashhad. Yeah, that's Finn, that's him. Oh uh, yeah, we, for, they, we might need a clicker. Yeah, sorry guys. Here we go. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It's, you'll see why it's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. Thanks for remembering. <laughs> um, this is why we're here together on stage, <laughs> to collaborate. Um, so I grew up in Iran, um, in the city called Mashhad. It's second largest city in Iran. And uh, yeah, that's me in my overalls, feeling good, feeling myself. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and. Uh, it is known as um, Shiite Muslim um, holy uh, city um, in Iran, which is, uh, it makes a very interesting sort of upbringing for, for someone who grew up in a family of uh, artists and poets and lawyers and army generals and teachers. Very, very confusing, um, very l loud. Um, those are my parents. Um, very loud and very fun. Uh, my parents made their best to provide um, a lot of gatherings, a lot of poetry readings, a lot of artists to come to our house and you know, talk to us and, and be part of our everyday lives. Um, and from a young age, I really knew that um, sort of my play was imagination and storytelling. Um, I used to uh, write, direct, and star in what I called my audio theaters. Uh, and I'm pretty convinced that it was, I invented podcasts and their tapes to prove it, um, but I'm not pursuing that anymore. But the, the love of like telling stories and using imagination to be able to do that and get my friends um, to act with me was very, very exciting. Um, I ended up going to college in Iran um, to study architecture. Um, and uh, when I was a teenager, I kind of started making it out west um, to pursue my higher education. I have lived and worked in three different continents and been lucky enough to um, work in companies like Ogilvy that I'm super proud of. Um, 
and Netflix, and currently uh, I'm a creative director um, at Airbnb. Um, my path to advertising and later in marketing has never been straight and narrow, but I wouldn't change a thing about it because um, it brings me here um, and um, it brings me next to this incredible woman who I'm really, really proud to know and call a really good friend now, hopefully. Um, and I have a pleasure of introducing her. Um, she is the chief strategy officer of, of Sid Lee all around badass woman, thoughtful, caring, and she's a partner also at Sidley. Um, she steers strategy for, um, uh, for human rights, women-led businesses, and board of education. So help me welcome Alana. Hi guys. And Alana has also an amazing story that she's gonna tell you. <laughs> Um, so I, there's a lot of similarities in our stories about um, hiding uh, culture um, where people don't see it, um, being able to uh, thrive um, through art somehow is, uh, is a really interesting uh, truth about both of us. Uh, I was born in uh, Soviet uh, Russia in, uh, in Kiev. Um, and uh, when my parents uh, applied to leave the Soviet Union, uh, they both lost their jobs, which was very typical of what had happened at the time. Um, what I recall very much about my childhood is uh, that the ability to speak your mind was very much uh, stunted. In fact, the houses that we had or we lived in um, were all bugged, and so the only places that you could have a conversation freely, we found, was in the forest. I'm convinced that this is why I love hiking to this day, um, because I feel very free in, uh, in the forest, and it was literally the only times that I heard um, you know, my family and parents uh, really speak. Um, what was interesting also, I think, about uh, Soviet Russia at the time uh, is, is this dichotomy of, um, you know, what success can be. Uh, you can, for example, so I was selected <laughs> uh, at two years old uh, to uh, skate. Um, this was, uh, in Russia, the only, in Soviet Russia, the only way that you could stand to see the world was if you excelled in something. And if you excelled in something or you had potential to excel in something, there was a way out uh, and you would get into the program. So my brother and I have a twin brother. We were selected to skate at two years old. Somehow somebody thought um, that we had the talent at two years old to make the Olympics, whatever, like 15 years later. And so we got into this program, um, which was very hopeful for my parents because it was a way for us to get out. Um, and. Uh, you know, it wasn't long. Uh, also, the other thing that I will say is that um, I had some, I had really interesting uh, grandmothers. Uh, one of them was a freedom fighter, um, so uh, in the forest with like a grade five education. And uh, the other one was uh, a Jewish cardiologist um, that was not allowed to leave because she was too important to uh, saving lives. Um, so uh, so they were, I spent a lot of time with them. And I learned, and then later we had left illegally because we just, my parents couldn't wait for the legal papers to go. So we had fake papers, which of course was very dangerous, but we left and it, uh, we, we got to go. These are my grandmothers. The, the little chubby one on one side is the freedom fighter and the other chubby one is the, <laughs> is, uh, is the doctor. Um, and uh, this is us in Italy. We, uh, we, we spent a lot of time in uh, going through Europe and Austria and in Italy. And um, uh, that's the Sistine Chapel where we, uh, where we got to, where I spent a lot of time because I would leave school and just sit and look at Michelangelo. Um, Michelangelo's works. So we, uh, we spent a lot of time in Italy. We finally got to Canada and uh, I went to McGill. I studied in cultural studies and anthropology and art history and then I worked in management consulting which also made no sense but it makes sense now. Um, and uh, all this and then also worked all over the world and uh, landed at Sidley which is now my home. 
And I think through both of these experiences, we've, we've learned certain things. So the first thing that we learned, maybe Nas can. Yeah. Um, just like Alana mentioned, like when, once we started talking on Zoom or WebEx or whatever it was and met, we started realizing that there is definitely common themes um, that all kind of lead to the way that not only we think about our teams or the way that we create what we create. So we wanted to just kind of talk to you guys from our personal experience of what some of these themes are and some of these overlaps are. And the first one is curiosity. Um, the reason that um, we chose this, I just want to put this up there. Because we like um, Iggy Pop. Because we like it, because we like Iggy Pop. Also, as a kid, I always knew that cat never died. I was like, that cat is coming back. He has nine lives. Like, it's not true. Um, but when you're growing up in, in a society like the one that I grew up in, the tension between public life and private life um, and the dichotomy that you get to live in between is one of the strongest um, magnetic poles that will determine ex who you are, what you do, how you end up becoming whatever you want to become. Um, on one side, society really does want you to believe in certain dogma and certain books that you might doubt and you might want to question. And they also want you to make sure that they also want to make sure that you're not asking any questions, that you're following the rule and you're moving towards what is already determined for you. On the other hand, I was very lucky to be born and raised in a family of thinkers and feminists. Um, by the way, there's no direct translation for feminism in Farsi, but if, anyone, if someone knows it, please come to me and tell me. Uh, but my dad, at like a really young age, like took me aside and said, hey kid, you gotta be independent. And it didn't make any sense at the time. It's like, am I an independent thinker? What, like, am I independent from men? Like, what's going on? Um, but w throughout the years, like by providing me with a lot of, uh, for example, inappropriate books that they put in my room, and they forced me to sit and read them, and I would ask questions at dinner, and they would always tell me to learn, learn more, learn more, and ask a lot of questions, and especially s question the status quo, which got me into trouble quite a bit, um, as you can imagine. Um, but, but what has happened with that is like that kind of a childlike curiosity still manifests itself for me by, for example, saying no to maybe a bad brief, maybe poking holes at the things that I have, that no one has any proof with data or, or backing. But most importantly, I think um, the idea of curiosity for me has manifested itself into um, being really, really interested in lear learning about others, um, about people, about their behaviors, what excites them, what makes them tick, and how to tell their stories. Um, and I think um, that's probably the greatest tool uh, that my upbringing has given me. Um, I think it's um, sort of even more rebellious these days to like lock eyes with people, look them in the eyes and ask them questions or just be quiet and listen to them. And that's, I think, the foundation of curiosity for me um, and the way that I get to luckily practice it in my everyday. Also, I wanted to put a Patti Smith uh, quote here, because why not? Uh, and Just Kids happens to be both of our favorite book that we didn't know, but now but we, we know. we learned. <laughs> yeah. I, and, you know, curiosity certainly has a link uh, to the future, right? Because if you don't think about the future or approach it with curiosity, you're just stuck in the past or you're just stuck. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's what we both learn to. It's unknown and it's scary, but you just have to like ask the questions, listen and move forward. So the other thing that we wanted uh, to, or we both shared, I think, is um, this idea that we could all lead with more tenacity and teach um, stronger resilience uh, to everybody that we're with. Um, or we have a, yes. Um, I think, again, one of the greatest gifts that we both think um, we learned from being in a place where we were marginalized to a certain degree or where um, you know, opinion, of, opinion was stunted or critical thought was stunted was now we, um, we believe that it's 
you have to take that kind of tenaciousness, uh, whether it's from a personal perspective or from a brand's perspective, and uh, really lead with purpose, lead with uh, belief, uh, uncover a brand's uh, belief system and create around that every single day. Uh, I read that brands that like truly operate on conviction irrespective of their categories, they outperform others at eight to one. Eight to one. So what is that? What do you actually believe? And when it's tested, are you able to live by those, um, uh, by, by those rules, by those convictions? I think that you know, the other difference between just surviving and uh, thriving creatively is being able to remove certain words from our vocabulary, being able to remove no or impossible, or can't, mm -hmm. and replace it with something else and systematize, systematize it. What we relays, re, you know, we can replace it with how can we, how might we, what if we did this? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we were talking about the other day is um, we, uh, what we quite like to do is what we call provoking the future. Um, and we provoke, the, and the reason why we do that is because of course none of us could be wrong about the future. So if you can't be wrong about the future, it creates this amazing space for creativity to thrive because anything, you can shoot anything against it and it could all of a sudden become possible. Yeah. It is really interesting, even though it's just like our personal experience, but we both end up working for companies that this idea of failure is not really questioned. You fail because no one else is doing it. You learn, you move on. And that's what you do, you keep doing that because as you said, Who's going to make mistakes about future? No one. You can't. And, and bring everybody along for the ride because then it's our failure or it's our success. But um, it's a real failure if you didn't actually try. You know? Yeah. Which brings us, I think, to um, the other part of things, which is uh, empathy. Um, and we say welcome empathy and belonging like it's a, like it's a mat to your door because she works for Airbnb and it just works. Um, <laughs> but also, uh, also because truthfully we are living in an empathy deficit and this is, a, this is true globally and it's so sad because our uh, greatest ambition, uh, I think as human beings, is to belong. But how might we belong, um, you know, when belonging is um, becoming something ephemeral? Uh, when you know empathy is in decline, what is it that you guys do at uh, Airbnb? Yeah. I think is really pretty remarkable uh, around how you we design systems for belonging. And yeah, that. I think um, I mean it, it goes without saying that like we get to be here today, or metaphorically, because we stand on the shoulders of people who open their hearts and open their doors to us throughout the years. Uh, you know, I had this amazing professor, Hassan Allahi. Um, he is a Bangladeshi American artist who gave me the chance um, to go to Cranbrook Academy and study in like one of the most progressive design schools and I think, like think and do critical thinking and like basically become who I am today. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have had the chance to go there. Um, I'm here because uh, Savoy Peacock, this like unicorn from San Francisco, gave me the chance to like get my first real advertising job. Um, so I personally find myself responsible um, to um, build teams, bring people together who um, exist on the intersection of age, race, more importantly, like just their personal stories, like where do they come from? What do they stand for? What are their values? Like, uh, you know, diversity is so multidimensional in that regards. And, and, and then I get to be, I, also I get to have, to have to cultivate. It's not easy. It's not easy to put everybody, you know, who comes from all these different backgrounds and, and say, oh, now figure it out. You know, as, as a leader, you have to be able to cultivate the talent and make sure that they understand that there's, uh, a, a path forward for them to succeed and to stand out. Um, but I'm also very lucky because um, now I get to work in um, a, a company like Airbnb that actually has a system in place to turn these philosophies into practices. We have gatekeepers um, like Bicky, 
um, who's standing right there, sitting, I'm sorry, sitting, okay. who, um, who bring people from France, India, Russia, Iran, Turkey, um, Sweden, England, all around the table. Like how many like creative directors do you guys know from Turkey, for example? Let's just like, let's be honest. But like she finds, she finds these incredible, remarkable people. And we all get to sit around the table and challenge each other. And trust me, the conversations are absolutely heated, but that's what you want. These are the people who I feel safe to go out and create work on behalf of our community, who's also incredibly diverse and comes from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, and no one said it was gonna be easy. It's definitely challenging and needs to be that way. Um, it's not easy to always um, have a, a diverse um, candidate slate. Um, that uh, you're interviewing at every stage of the process. It's not easy to extract biases from every processes, people processes, work processes on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not easy to always encourage your team to start groups that celebrates their individuality and like who they are and where they come from or advocate for the is issues that um, they, they believe in. But that's what we do and, and it's hard, but it's wonderful because it's about people. Um, so. I think just being at Airbnb has like really um, emphasized the fact of how important this is um, and how important it is to have the right people at the right time at the table because we all win. Because those are the people who are going to tell these stories. And if we want these stories to be authentic, then we need to invite all of them to the table in order to do so. But we've talked about this in your practices and also with Sid Lee. So yeah. it'd be great for you to share that as well. Yeah, I will. Um, I, uh, I think, I think uh, you know, for us, uh, we've always had this saying, um, we're the place where misfits fit. Um, but to create, to design a place where misfits fit, um, it's not just a question of hiring. We are talking about this um, incessantly. Is that hiring is just like the start of it? Uh, really, uh, the art and the science comes in in terms of how you integrate that. Um, and there's, uh, from a cultural standpoint, um, you know, there's a, there's something we do. But then I read that actually it's a it's an organizational behavioral theory that we just ended up doing. But I realized was something that actually has creative results in some of it that you see here. Um, is uh, called cultural brokering. And so what we do is we'll mix people that come, it's kind of like a tea, people that have a lot of multicultural experiences with people who have deep monocultural experiences. And we mix those in mixed pods like you would also do with people in advertising of multiple um, uh, skill sets. So people that are deep on something and people that are generalist. And then you put them on a problem. Uh, and we're, we're really lucky because we get to um, tackle kind of broader uh, problems with clients that ask us to look at it from these multiple cultural perspectives. So that's something that everybody can do. Um, and uh, I think, you know, what I do want to say is tap it, create that feeling in your own organization. We know that when you come from a place where you're not wanted, the feeling of belonging is highly visceral. You notice it in people when they don't feel at home, they sort of like, they turn in as a shell onto themselves. And when people feel like they belong and you know you've designed a space for it, their body language says everything. They're able to walk into a room and feel like they can jam with you on that amazing problem or issue or creative thing. When they don't, it's quiet. Um, so pay attention to that. How are you creating that kind of feeling is really important. How are you walking, um, you know, your values versus having them just sit on a wall is super important. So the, what we want to just impart on you for us is, um, uh, and something that we have to practice every day truthfully, don't be afraid to take chances because status quo 100% is always riskier than change. Stay curious about the future because we are all the future at stake. I love that line. A writer at Sidley wrote it, so I just want to give him creds. Yeah. <laughs> but we are uh, the future at stake. And, um, and have a tenacity um, to put conviction in your brand and your voice and care deeply. It's hard, but it's worth it. 
Um, and this is my favorite Mine one. Mine too. Yeah. Too. Design the workplace as you would your home. Yeah, if it doesn't feel like home, you ha we are not doing it right. No. Keep it kind and keep it clean. That's what we say. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, and then we just wanted to leave you, we're kind, a little bit into data, um, uh, but we wanted to leave you with this thought is, you know, if women were to participate in the workforce at the same um, way that men do, so fully, um, an additional $28 trillion or 26% of the incremental global GDP would be achieved by 2025. So try to create those lanes, those runways. It's up to us. We are the future at stake. And also, you know, your company will be more valuable for it. So it's, you know, it, your company will be less valuable if you don't do it. So, you know, there we are. That's, that's our thoughts. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks so much.